Okay. Hello and welcome to the session of Project Virtual Conference 2018. Uh, today we have Mr. Brian Smith with us and he is going to be presenting on the general data protection regulation. Um, now before we get started, I just want to let all the attendees know that you can use the chat as an um, option to ask questions. And uh, without much further ado, handing it over to Mr. Brian Smith, take it away. Okay, thank you very much and welcome to day two of the Project Virtual Conference. I'm glad to be uh, back and talking to you about general data protection regulation today. Uh, I'm not going to cover the full regulation because we'd probably need uh, weeks for that rather than uh, just one hour. I'm really talking about how it applies to uh, Microsoft Project, Microsoft Planner, um, both the Project Online and also Project Server as well. Uh, so I'll be going through a walkthrough of some of the uh, sort of data requests that you might get from uh, from data subjects and how you would handle them. Uh, but before I do that, I'd just like to thank all of our sponsors and uh, their names are on this slide. So thanks everyone that uh, helped to make this such a great event. And, uh, and, and straight into it. So the GDPR came in on the 25th of May, uh, 2018. Um, this slide was written slightly before that, so it says it becomes enforceable. Uh, it became enforceable. I needed to update that and forgot. Um, and even though it is really a U, an EU data regulation, uh, it is something that's seen as a um, potentially something that would be taken on beyond uh, the, the borders of Europe and be a, a model for uh, privacy uh, worldwide. But it does also apply to companies uh, who operate in countries outside the EU because they may well be dealing with citizens and residents of the EU. Uh, so, you know, it does affect uh, a lot of companies. Um, some companies have decided not to do business in the EU anymore because they, they saw the overhead of, uh, of having to handle this a problem. Um, usually they were pretty small companies that um, could see it as a, a fairly onerous task. Most of the large companies um, have just really uh, adjusted to take account of um, GDPR and made sure that they've got processes in place to, to meet the regulation. Um, so who's subject to it? Anyone who processes, controls personal data about EU citizens' residents is subject to GDPR. And this includes Microsoft, who I work for, and it also includes our customers. Uh, and the products that it covers, obviously our cloud services, both uh, consumer products, but also things like Project Online, Microsoft Planner, um, it covers all of our supported on-premises products, so Project Server um, 2013, 2016 are all covered. It covers the, uh, the client applications, also covers the back-end systems as well. So there's pretty broad coverage. Uh, and the definition of, of personal data is any data that could be tied back to or is owned by an individual. So some of it's obvious, like a name address, an email, a uh, particular location, your sort of tax number, um, personal email or documents. And then it could be data that's just linked back to a person. So I'm, I may have written uh, a PowerPoint on my Disney trip and it's only got one owner and that's me. So it can be inferred that that is my trip uh, and that's my document. So there, there's sort of an inference as well on some of the personal data. Um, it also applies to product and service usage. So some of the telemetry that's captured when you're using an application uh, will be um, be able to be tied back to a, an individual. So that's something that uh, is covered by GDPR. And also things like search requests as well. So if you're searching uh, using Bing or searching in Edge or uh, any of our, our competitive uh, search product, that would sort of cover you as well. Uh, in terms of high-level requirements, uh, there's a requirement for the subject to be able to view and access their data. Now, obviously, some of this data is just easily accessible. It's your own Word documents. It's your own Excel documents. It's, it's Planner and OneDrive. So, so that's pretty much covered. Um, there's also a, a requirement for you to be able to export your data as well. And I'll be going over some of the export capabilities there. And the, the wording used is in a structured, commonly used and machine readable format without hindrance from the controller. So it's basically as a data controller, Microsoft has to make that data available in a way that it can be consumed. 
Now, uh, often that's XML uh, or JSON. They're the sort of most common formats for it to be coming through in. In some cases, it's just sort of the, the normal document format that uh, the document's in because that is um, uh, something that can be read. Uh, also, there's a requirement that uh, data should be deleted. So the controller should have the obligation to erase personal data without undue delay. Now, there's obviously various sort of legal things around the deletion of the data. Uh, if I phoned up the, uh, the Inland Revenue or the IRS and said, no, please, please forget me and delete me, uh, I think they probably say no. So, you know, there are times when data won't be deleted. There is a, a legal obligation to, to keep information for a certain number of years. So, so that's something that uh, um, needs to be taken into account as well. I'm not going into the legal side of some of those uh, questions. I'm really just talking about how uh, the data can be made available. Uh, and it can depend on uh, the length of time as well. So if the... Um, without undue delay tends to be considered as sort of within 30 days. So if you've got data that doesn't live beyond 30 days, then there's no real need to be able to delete it because it's going to get deleted in 30 days anyway. So that sort of covers that. Um, in terms of exporting, you'd need to be able to export within those 38, 30 days. Uh, and in terms of less than 48 hours, if the data is just sort of sitting around for a couple of days, then there's no obligation to export it because the, uh, the time you've got to export it would be greater than the 48 hours. So in some cases, data that uh, like some telemetry may not live for very long. So there's no sort of GDPR requirement on, on that because it's sort of there and gone. So that's, um, it's not something that's uh, considered as covered by that. So um, there's various different roles that are played. Microsoft as a, as a data controller is really when we're working with consumers. So we can get a request from a consumer uh, and they'll want um, their, their data. Uh, so we'll sort of bring it all together and export it. And there's pages you can go to, which I'll have links to later, where you can sort of make those requests happen. So, so that's Microsoft as a, a data controller. Um, and in terms of deleting, you can choose which data to delete. Obviously, you can also ask for certain things like, you know, forget what I did on February the 1st. So in this particular case, we've got some details of what was happening on February the 1st by user ID 1. Uh, and we can say, okay, that user asked to be forgotten. So we've still got that record and we know that somebody uh, booted project, open project and saved on February the 1st, but we don't know who it was. We've deleted their user ID. So we sort of delinked the data. So it doesn't mean we have to delete the telemetry data. It just means that we have to uh, delink it and make sure we can't associate it with a person anymore. Now, the other role, um, well, one of the other roles is the data processor. And in this uh, scenario, Microsoft is acting as a data processor when we're running a service for a customer. So Contoso could be our customer. They may have employees. They may have their own customers as well. Um, they would make a request, but in this case, the request wouldn't come to Microsoft. It would be going to the Contoso tenant admin. Uh, and then the tenant admin has the capability through the admin center uh, and through security and compliance to be able to make that request. Um, that is then sort of processed. Um, we get telemetry data. There can be project online data. There can be planner data. That would go back to the Contoso tenant admin. And at that point, it's really the admin's job to decide what gets given back to that employee. Because for instance, if I was working for a, a, a company that was doing some pretty secret stuff, um, I might want my data, but the admin isn't gonna give me the sort of full project plan with all of the, the details of the, the top secret stuff. Uh, they're just gonna uh, redact that information and only sort of pass on to me that, yeah, I was working on something from this time to this time, that kind of thing. So, you know, there is obviously a, it's not just sort of carte blanche to get everything from your employee that includes, you know, potentially sensitive information. So there is a, an element of redaction that needs to go on as well. Uh, so starting off with, with planner and what we have available there, there's a couple of parts to this. So if a, if a request came into the Contoso tenant admin, um, there's two parts to it. Uh, part of it is covered by the sort of general um, 
Microsoft capabilities in GDPR that's handled through the sort of enterprise uh, privacy portal. And that sort of handles all the telemetry across all of the products. So there's one place to go for, for that information. And then the tenant admin would also be able to uh, run some specific PowerShell commands to get the, the planner content out. And that's one of the things I'll be stepping through later. Um, so there's sort of, again, there's a redaction element here where you'd want to go through those plans and work out, okay, what, what is in those plans? Um, what don't I want to pass on to that particular employee? Example here are some of the telemetry that might sort of come out. It might sort of tell you um, what action you took on what app. So you'd get sort of that output from the sort of general requirement. And then from the planner export, that's where you'd get the, the more sort of detailed information where you'd see the name of the, uh, the group, um, who created it and what time it was created, uh, when it was last updated, all those kind of things. And I'll, I'll show you some of that later. And that's in a, in a JSON format. So um, that would include uh, any plans that you're sort of a user in, any plans that you have set as your recent uh, plans or favorite plans, and your settings and configs as well. So that's the user specific data, but also plans where you're a group owner, or if you're the creator or signed to or completed a task as well. So in terms of the plan, the planet export content, uh, it's a PowerShell command. Uh, you'd put in either the user principal name or the object ID, so it'll take both. Uh, the tenant admin has the capabilities to do this and he would connect to the, the SPO admin um, via PowerShell and then run this sort of export planner user content, give the principal name, give an output folder. And then there'd be a whole ton of uh, JSON files created in that folder and it would be the tenant admin's role to go through then and work out, okay, what can be passed back to the, uh, the requester uh, and what can't, and they do the redaction there. In terms of deletion, um, there's, there's again two parts to that. One is the telemetry part, which is sort of general across Microsoft. The second part is the, the planner service itself. So uh, in this case, all plans and tasks would re re remain, but the deleted user would now say former user. So we're, we're not removing their details, we're just anonymizing them. So you wouldn't know who had done that particular thing. Uh, and then it's the tenant admin's job to manually remove any personal plans. So if I'd sort of uh, put a plan uh, within planner uh, at work to um, handle my vacation plans or something like that, then the tenant admin would just go in and delete that. That's covered in the documentation that I'll be giving links to later. So Project Online, very similar uh, flow here. So we could get a request coming into the Contoso tenant admin. Um, he would do the general stuff via the enterprise privacy policy, pr privacy portal. He would then need to figure out the PWA sites and owners that affected that particular request. Uh, and there's a command that will tell you all of your PWA sites. You then have to go to your PWA admin probably if your Contoso tenant admin wasn't also a PWA admin uh, and give them a request to find out all the information from the PWAs about that particular resource. Um, again, there's some PowerShell commands that you'd run against Project Online. That would create a lot of export files. There'd then be the, the, the job of going through and, and redacting those export files, passing them back through to the tenant admin, who would then pass them back through to the person who would requested that data. Uh, again, telemetry, there'd be things like uh, actions of project created, updated, that kind of thing. So you can see exactly what time certain things happened. Uh, and there's also sort of project client telemetry as well going on at the same time. So the export of the content um, is mainly in JSON format linked to the user. So there's information on the user, timesheets, statusing, um, their engagements, resource plans, the, uh, the SharePoint data, portfolio data, uh, server settings, that kind of thing, workflows, status reports. So all of that information is, is output in, uh, in JSON format. So there's initial PowerShell script that will get all of your SPO sites and work out which ones have PWA enabled. And then per PWA, you'd have to go in as a site collection admin. Uh, so the PWA admin usually in that case, and, and also run the re request to get that information out. 
You'd also need to have the project client, and I'll, I'll show you this later. Uh, when you run the command, it goes through and pulls a lot of JSON files out, but it would also need to open the project files as well. Uh, and it saves off a copy of the MPP, uh, both a copy from draft and published, because they may be different. It may be that uh, the person has been removed from the draft copy of the plan, but it hasn't been published yet. So they would still exist in the published, but they wouldn't be in the draft. So we need to look at those as two independent plans. Um, it also produces an XML copy uh, of both of those as well, which sort of fulfills the sort of transferable data uh, capability. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about the XML of the project a little bit later because it doesn't include everything that's in there. So there would be sort of further jobs where the uh, tenant admin would have to go through or the PWA admin and work out if there's data that was identified in the XML uh, where they do need to go in and look and see what that data is. Uh, a typical example of that is somebody's embedded um, some content within a task. Now we don't export that content out to the XML file. So um, we would show that in the XML that there's some customized data there. It would then be the admin's job to go in and see what that customized data was and see if it was anything that needed to be passed on to the uh, requesting subject. Um, so the next job then is, is redact the data, pass it onto the user. Uh, and as I mentioned, there's some customized areas where there might be sort of views or VBA uh, that would need a little bit of deeper digging to work out whether they contained any sort of personal personal info that needed to be passed back or, or redacted. And then there's another field that says objects contain notes. So that's all. I think it's actually notes contain objects. Uh, so if you've got a notes field with something embedded in it, uh, that again is something you need to go in and look and see what was embedded and what's in it and, and whether that needs to be uh, produced and handed back to the requester. Uh, delete is a sort of similar process, a general process for the telemetry side, same as the rest of the Microsoft telemetry. Uh, for Project Online, there's a PowerShell that can be executed per user, per PWA. And this gets a little bit more complicated because there's lots of different types of data that you might want to delete or you might not want to delete. Uh, for example, you might want to remove the user from the project plan. Uh, but you have a requirement to keep their timesheet records for a certain time. Uh, you may be allowed to keep their timesheet records intact with their display name against them. You may have to redact that display name, but have some identifiable uh, form so that you know that timesheet line or all of the timesheet lines that have the same ID were the same person, but you don't know who that person is anymore. So there's various different levels that that can be done. Um, so we, we sort of remove personal data. We, we can leave the display name as is, uh, but we would delete the account login, the email, claim, start end dates, um, calendar exception descriptions, for example, would be another thing, because it might be that uh, I've got a calendar exception for my birthday. So that would need to be removed because that, in effect, identifies me. Now, custom fields are untouched. So if you're putting personal information into custom fields, that's something that you would have to sort of deal with separately. That's not something that our scenarios cover because we can't know what you've used custom fields for. So that's something that's sort of beyond the scope of what our scripts do, but something that uh, an organization would need to consider in terms of GDPR. Uh, so you get to choose to rename a user. So you could put in deleted user or gone and forgotten or all those kind of things, um, remove all the personal data. Or the final option, it could be that you rename the user, but you leave the timesheet. So if this is a case where you generate a new resource ID um, and you'd sort of replace that. So you could still sort of see the timesheets that were all entered by the same person, um, but they'd have a new res ID generated on them that we'd also see in, in OData, for example. So again, this is PowerShell, so script to get a list of uh, PWA site collections in the tenant and then execute those on a per PWA basis. And I'll be doing this against uh, one of my PWAs um, shortly. So the data flow for, for a project online would be export the data, uh, redact the user, manually delete any personal projects that were there and clear out the project cache for desktops that opened related projects. Uh, now, again, this is something where um, 
if you know what you're doing or you've got a project checked out, it could be that you've got a copy in your local cache. So it's no, um, no answer to just do that work on the server and clean the server up if there's people that are, can just open it from their local cache and they see the information that shouldn't be there anymore. Uh, so the, the local cache would also need to be cleared of all of those projects as well. Um, you'd probably then need to do another data export just to make sure that everything was gone that you were expecting to be to be gone. Sort of the, the, the final check on that one. So I'll break on for a demo now and I'm going to go over to my, my desktop. So you should be seeing my desktop now. Um, there's a number of documents. I've got links in the in the PowerPoint later on for these. So um, there's export user data from Microsoft Planner, delete data from Microsoft Planner, and then export and delete from Project Online. And then more details about the export data definition. So when we produce the JSON files, you can come here and see what is in those JSON files and how they're, they're structured. Um, some other information that helps you find that customized data I talked about. So when we identify in the XML that something's been customized, um, this will help you sort of work out how to get to that data uh, and see what, see what needs to be done with it. Um, there's also the export user data from project server and delete user data from project server. And I'll go through project server when I get back to the slides again. Uh, it's a very similar process. Um, slightly different in terms of how it's executed because you do have access to the databases directly. So some of it is, is, uh, is handled in a slightly different way. Uh, it also has some nuances because of things like the archive database. So you need to redact information from the archive. But I'll, I'll talk through that when I get to the, uh, the slides for that one. So I'm going to start off in my PowerShell uh, command here. And I've already brought in from the document some of the commands that I need to use. Uh, I've already connected to the SPO service. So in this case, when you run this first line, it will prompt you for a username and password. I'm connecting to the admin site here. So this is connecting to the service. This isn't, isn't just connecting to my tenant. Uh, so something to be aware of there. Um, the next line will go off and see who the owner is for all of these PWA sites so that I know as a tenant admin who I need to go and see to get the per PWA stuff run. So if I execute that, that will go off to my uh, tenant, which is my Bryce Smith PGO on Microsoft.com tenant, which is my, my test tenant. And it comes back with all of these PWA sites um, that I've got set up. Um, the majority of these have got very little data in. Um, I, I do occasionally sort of need to generate one in a different language pack. For instance, uh, I see Welsh there, which is a, an interesting one, um, to, just to see and do some testing on them. So I've got a number here that I've sort of configured in different ways. Many of them don't have very much data in them at all. Now, in terms of exporting the project user content, uh, then this is the command that handles uh, that. I'm going to run this second one, which I think will be for uh, a user that I'm then going to redact. So if I execute this command, uh, I get an error uh, because I'm not in the right directory. Uh, just a second. That should be the right one now. Let's try that. Okay, so that asked me to log in. So even though I'm connected to the service, this is now sort of using a different connection. So I need to log in. And go off and grab my password paste that in. And now it runs a few things. It's getting the custom field data, it's getting workflow data. It's then looking for the draft project list and it's firing up project and opening a project from draft. And it's Sarah B. Davis was the person that I was doing the uh, 
this particular run for. So it's just going to open the projects that uh, she has been assigned to. There's a couple that I made sure she was in. So it's going to open the project from the draft and also from the published schema. It's going to save the MPP. It's all going to, also going to save off um, an XML format as well. And we should be able to see that data coming in. This is um, loading up a little bit slowly this time, so I'm hoping it hasn't hit hit a problem. Um, when I was testing this out, I did I did come across a couple of uh, things that you probably need to know about. We're going to get sort of a tips and tricks section put together. There was one area where I had my configuration for uh, disabling macros, but giving me a notification so I could enable them on boot. And because of that dialogue, uh, it was failing to to load up. So I set it to uh, disable and not give me a notification. Uh, there can also be issues if you have a master project with sub projects that as it goes through the process, it may ask you to save a project if it thinks there's a change just because of the way it opened the project. So there's a couple of things that uh, you can run into that can slow things down, but I'm not quite sure what, um, what this one is uh, unhappy with at the moment. So I'll just jump over this. And I'll just close that one for now. So my apologies for that. I'm not quite sure what happened in that particular case, but I will see whether that restarts at this point. But I'll take you over to the file that that created, and that should have been this output here. So it did sort of start the process and got most of the information there. Uh, it was it did the draft projects. It was moving on to the uh, the published projects. So it seems to have hit a problem with those. So uh, I won't dig into that too much just now and um, and bore you with the troubleshooting. Um, but I'll look into that uh, that later on. Uh, but what we can see here is the various different um, JSON files that it it created as it sort of went through, and it's still exporting some more behind there as well uh, once it finished that. Um, and we can see here that it, there were two projects that are identified um, and it's produced uh, an MPP of the project, uh, a JSON file of the, the OData from the project. It's also produced an XML file of the project as well. We have done some work on the XML file. So this isn't the pure XML that you will have seen with the save to XML in earlier releases. Uh, I can't remember which month we put this out in. It was probably it was either in the April or the May updates that we actually updated the XML format for all of the uh, project server versions. Um, so you, you will now have this extra capability. It, it still doesn't give you a, sort of a, of a truly faithful representation of, of everything that's in the project. Um, but it, it does save off a lot more than it used to. But we, d we don't sort of guarantee that it's uh, um, the right thing to use for sort of round tripping and, and keeping sort of a faithful representation of the project. Um, there will still be things like uh, objects in notes and customized views and those kind of things, which was just don't get carried through to the XML. Uh, we can see as well there's some more um, information here in various JSON files, and I can just open up those JSON files. Um, I'm using uh, Visual Studio Code to, to view these. Obviously, you can just open them in Notepad as well. Uh, so I've got a few open, open here. So here I can see there's various different uh, assignments for this particular resource uh, that have been saved off. I get the information about sort of custom fields that are associated with them as well. So uh, I'm sure this gives us a, you know, I, I, I was looking at this earlier on today thinking there's, there's, there's some useful stuff here that might be handy for a tenant admin to use um, regardless of a GDPR request. It might be a good way of getting some data out of project to sort of review certain things. So I think the, we'll probably see this JSON being used for more than just the GDPR uh, requests going through. Some of the other ones I'd loaded up earlier on from a, a run that I did on, on myself uh, so there's some timesheet data there in the timesheet JSON. Uh, there's my task status assignment history. So it gives me all of that information about who the approver was, who the submitter was, um, the transaction UIDs and all the, uh, the actual work there as well. So that, that looks like sort of a handy um, set of data that you might want to sort of pull out uh, independently of any GDPR requests if you were sort of drilling around for 
for something. So that's sort of the project information. And then we get the sort of the, the general sort of server information. So things like the, uh, the reporting resource uh, security information, for example. So if I go in here, I can see that Sarah B. Davis has got this resource ID. That's her encoded claim. Um, and the various sort of groups and permissions that are set up for that particular user. So there's a ton of stuff there that it sort of pulls back when it does the, um, the data export. So assuming that that had all gone well, which it didn't, but bear with me, um, I'll now look at the, the project online uh, redaction. So if I go in here, I can run this request or this invoke redact project user. I'm calling the same URL. So this is going off to my brysmith pgo.sharepoint.com sites PWA. The resource ID is the one for uh, Sarah who I just did the export for. Um, the updated display name I'm gonna use is redacted username. You, know, you could put removed user or whatever you want in there. Um, there was some discussion internally uh, as to whether this is also potentially a way to rename a resource if you need to rename a resource. So you know, again, this might be um, potentially have uses outside of GDPR, but probably something we need to look into a little bit deeper to work out the scope of, uh, of that. So I'm going to run this one and say yes to that. It's going to ask me again to sign in. And hopefully my password is still cached there. And that's come back. So if I now open a project again, hopefully it will open for me this time. It hasn't gone down a hole. I'll open other projects, PGO, browse. We can see this project was last accessed at uh, 7.28, I think Sarah was in this project. So the project has inactive enterprise resources with remaining work and my, this has already told me that it's worked because that would normally say Sarah, but uh, it's made her inactive and it's also changed her name to redacted username. I don't know whether you saw briefly when it did come up on the screen that this, this particular task was assigned to Sarah B. Davis, which was uh, uh, the person that I'd redacted. So I've still got a project plan that's still accurate and intact, uh, but it has the, the resource name uh, removed from it. So, I mean, it hasn't deleted the task or anything like that. So that's, that's project online. Uh, I'm gonna move on to planner now, and then I'll get back to the slides and talk through the on-premises version. Um, so planner that handles it slightly differently, um, it just in terms of the, the execution of it. So they have a, uh, a PowerShell module, so I can import the module. And then once I've imported the module, that has the export planner user content inside it. So I'm not directly having to look for that particular PS1. It is, is actually a, um, a command that is within this module. So here I've put in my uh, principal name, Brian Smith at brysmithpgo.microsoft.com. I've given it an export directory. This must exist uh, and be empty. For project, it will create it if it doesn't exist. So there's a few slight variations there on, on how these, uh, these commands uh, interact. So if I run that selection, again, it will ask me to log in. And say next, my password should still be there. And it will go off and, and do its stuff. So very similarly to, uh, to project, this will be going off and putting data into my output to directory. And it's putting it into a directory based on my name. Uh, the folder's currently empty, but hopefully it will soon fill up as it is. And we can start seeing the data uh, whizzing in here. 
And we can see that for each of the plans that I'm involved in, it has output a file. It has also output a file, a separate file for my user information as well. And for those who were with me yesterday, um, I'm just trying to see whether my project, yeah, so if, if those of you who were with me yesterday when I did the session on change management for Office 365, uh, sadly, I recognize the, uh, the plan ID of this plan, beginning with SEQ, my Office 365 change management plan. So again, this, this is output in a JSON format. Um, it has a text um, ending, so it doesn't open it as a JSON file in code, which the other one would have done. You could just change that and it would open um, in, a, in a different application. But here we can see my ID of my particular plan, along with my created date, and then I see all of my tasks and all of the various properties of the tasks, who they're assigned to, who created them, and there's a ton of stuff there. Um, we can see here, for example, the applied categories. So for this particular task, I can see that my categories three, four, and five are selected for that one. Um, so obviously I'd need to know what three, four, and five were. Uh, I, could, I could easily find that out from, uh, from graph, from plan ID. So again, it's getting a ton of information out here on what my plans were, and it would then be down to the, um, the tenant admin to work out what needed passing on, or if there's anything that needed redacting from any of these plans. So that's what the plan text looks like. If I go down to the user text, this is really just sort of my user information. So this, this says who I am, um, what my user details ID is within Planner, what my external ID is in, in AD. Um, it also shows which are my favorite plans. As I mentioned earlier, it records which are my favorites, which are my recent plans. So it gets a lot of information there um, on all the various plans that I've, uh, I've had access to as a user. So that's all of the, uh, the planner export information. Uh, I wasn't gonna jump into the delete information, but you probably noticed there that, again, I can see potentially other uses for that kind of information. If I wanted to sort of take my planner information and, and put it somewhere else as well, then that, uh, that JSON file would be a good place to start. So back to the slides and I'll just start up and switch my displays over so you get the, the cool one. So that was a demo. Some of the gotchas, we, we don't search through text fields, uh, custom fields for resource names. So if you're using a, uh, a custom field on a lookup table and you're populating that lookup table with the names of people, then we don't detect that as part of this process. But that's something that your tenant admin or your PWA admin would have to take into account that, yep, if that person's asked to be forgotten and they're also an entry in a lookup table, you probably need to attend to that as well. Uh, so we don't delete, redact that data. Uh, if you've got calculated fields, obviously you'd need to republish for those calculated fields to change if you had some calculations that were based on, uh, on resource names or anything like that. Now for Project Server, uh, supported versions uh, 2010 right through to 2016. So there was actually an update for 2010 that went out in, in May uh, that contained the, the new XML capabilities. So that's something to be aware of. Um, so they have multi-step SQL and PowerShell flows to get the data out in a very similar set of data to what I've already shown you with Project Online. Uh, 2019, we'll just have a couple of PowerShell commandlets, an export commandlet and a delete commandlet. It's very much in line with Project Online in terms of the, uh, the data structures and the, the architecture. So that was the, the easiest way to go for those ones. Um, Telemetry, obviously you're in control of the telemetry when you're running the on-premises server. So you'd have to go through uh, the ULS logs and then search on the SharePoint online login ID or the Resu ID uh, to get that user information. Uh, and then delete the ULS logs when a delete request arrives or just don't keep longer than 30 days because you don't, if you're gonna delete them within 30 days, then there's no need to have any special request to delete because they're gonna be gone anyway. Um, if you're on any version less than 2019, then for each project instance on each farm, you'd need to get the res ID and connect to SQL Server and execute SQL scripts, which will um, get you most of the information. 
the same information as in the JSON files that I was already showing you. Uh, then there's some PowerShell to get user, set, user settings and some statusing history. You'd need to query on the issues, risks, and deliverables, uh, looking for the display name and claim to get that information out. And then for each interesting project, so the ones you identified had that res ID in it, you'd need to open those in project client and save as XML. So the same kind of thing as the, the script went through for project online. Now where it gets quite tricky is if you're using the archive feature with project, because obviously you could save many copies of that same project in the archive directory. So what you would need to do is back up the current project using archive, restore an older version, export the project, save as XML, and then restore the original project back again. And you'd need to do that for every archived version. So if you were keeping five copies of every project, you'd have to save the current project, then open each of the other five in turn uh, and save them um, out as XML, and then at the end, restore your original back. If you're using archive with resources, that gets even trickier because you'd have to set up another farm where you could restore those because you don't want to restore your archive resources into your current farm. So you'd need to do that on a, uh, a separate farm and then run through the export for those restored uh, resources from the archive. So you know, it's, it's quite an, an onerous task there to, uh, to clean up all of that data or to, even to export all of that data. Uh, and then the deletion. Um, process very much the same. You'd have to go through the res, res, res ID. Uh, you'd also have to update the resource calendar, clear out exceptions, republish all projects with the resource, um, clear out the project client cache, same as we did for project online for any client that may have opened that project or has opened that project. Um, query for all possible claims, run a redaction script for issues risks, uh, update all resources with the new assignment owner because that assignment owner is now a deleted user. So you'd have to obviously pass those off uh, for other uh, assignment owners to, to now manage. And then you'd also have to de delete archive projects and resources as well that you'd identified as having that resource in. Uh, a couple of pages of, of content to, to help you uh, get through this. Um, one is the Trust Center. These are the sort of the general Microsoft contents. The Trust Center, there's a, a GDPR getting started article. Um, there's a good article on the project entities and actions in the export logs, which I, I showed you earlier. The Office 365 GDPR document, that's a, that's a pretty long one. Uh, and one thing I, I, I was working through fairly recently was um, uh, one of the Microsoft uh, edX courses. And that looked into ethics and law in data and analytics. And there was a, a section of that that sort of talked a little bit about GDPR as well. But that's an interesting, uh, interesting session if you want to sort of learn a little bit more about the background and ethics of, uh, of data and, and analytics. Big hot topic at the moment. And then the project and planner content, so uh, the ones that I uh, showed you uh, earlier when we were in the desk sharing, um, export user data from planner, delete data from planner, export delete from online, the data definitions, help to find the customized data, and then the export and delete for project server. Uh, there's also another article that's coming through on exporting user activity data in project online, so that one's still uh, going through the pipeline at the moment, sort of work out exactly what needs to, to be in that. So that was all I had to talk about on uh, GDPR. Uh, plenty there, I think you'll, uh, you'll agree. Uh, my contact details, brian.smith at microsoft.com. I'm on Twitter at Lunch with a Lens. And also there's the two Microsoft blogs, the msdn.microsoft.com, the Brian Smith one, and the uh, TechNet project support one. So I tend to do a lot of the planner and development stuff on the Bry Smith one, uh, a lot more of the sort of regular updates and project updates go out on the project support uh, blog from uh, Diana and some of my other colleagues who help maintain that one. So that's all I had to talk about. I haven't seen whether there's anything coming up in chat, but I did hear a couple of beeps, but I don't know whether that was just coming from uh, the, the general chat in the, uh, in the lobby, because I think I had a browser open on that, I realized halfway through. Um, <laughs> but are there any questions? I'll see if I can find the, okay. the chat. 
Well, it doesn't look like there are any questions at this time. But um, thank you so much for taking the time to come um, be part of us, uh, Mr. Smith. And uh, I just want to let all the attendees know that uh, we will have the um, uh, this uh, video available on HD quality um, for on demand for later use if you need to go back and revisit. And uh, thank you all for being a part of this today. And uh, last but not least, thank you to all our sponsors for making this happen. Thank you so much. Oh, I think we have one question. Yep, uh, the JSON. Now there isn't an import capability for the JSON. You could certainly use that JSON as input for uh, an application written to use the REST calls to put that data into another instance. So I mean, you, you know, it could be used as a source that you could put into um, something else, but there isn't a, a, a specific import function to move that into another instance. But great question, Eric. Um, I don't know the exact uh date it will be available i'm guessing it should be available by the end of the day um, but i will have to confirm that for you and uh, let you know takia um, any other questions okay i just got a, a word saying that it will be available in a couple of days okay great thank you very all much right. all for thank attending. you all so much and have a great day bye-bye bye-bye